Welcome to Investor in the Family Radio, a podcast dedicated to helping you make better investments in less time so you can live more life. My name is Brian Bain and I'm your host. You can find more shows and other valuable content at InvestorInTheFamily.com. Well, on today's show, we have a special guest, Victor Durganov. Victor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Brian. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Absolutely. Well, it's great to have you as well. For anyone in our audience, Victor is an author on Seeking Alpha, and he wrote an article recently on Tesla. He covers Tesla regularly, but one specifically caught my attention a few weeks ago entitled Tesla, A Strong Buy, Model 3 Profitability Much Greater Than Perceived. And for anyone who remotely follows Tesla, you can imagine there was lots of response to this article. As of today, June 15th, there were 623 comments, which... I, I, you know, I, 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 every now and then I'll see articles with three to 400 comments, which is a lot, but 623 is pretty astounding. There's a lot of people who have very emotional interest in Tesla. <laughs> and so basically we, I, I saw the article from, um, Victor and asked him to come on the show and kind of discuss it with us a little bit more in depth. So, um, we're excited to have you. Excellent. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Tesla is, is my favorite company. So, um, I'll be very happy to talk about it. For sure. Well, and let me, so let's do this. I want to, it's hard because I want to jump into the, the meat of the article, but I'm also just fascinated by just how engaged the Tesla audience is. I mean, I think in any platform, but especially Seeking Alpha. And I'm just curious if you have any, any thoughts on that yourself as far as why Tesla specifically has the um, following that it does both pro and con, you know, positive and either, either people love it or hate it, you know? Yeah, I, I do have some thoughts about that. Well, first of all, about my article, you're not going to see uh, an article often anywhere, but probably specifically on, on Seeking Alpha that has Tesla and Strong Buy in the same, in, in the title, basically. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's just something you don't see every day. So the thing about Tesla and, and Seeking Alpha, the reason why um, Tesla garners such a, such attention and such intense commentary is because well one reason is because Tesla is a company that people love to hate. I mean the financials from first glance just look atrocious. The company the stock looks so overvalued. It's 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 incredible, and there's it's it's the most heavily shorted company in America, possibly even the world. I mean, it's got it, it's got more than ten billion dollars worth of uh, worth of sh- short position in the stock. So basically, people are billion? wagering. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Basically, people people are wagering over ten billion dollars that the stock is gonna you know either significantly go down or collapse. And I'll tell you this: that since uh, since the company went public, since basically Tesla's inception, you know, in the public markets. Um, it has it has had a, a short position of at least twenty percent, you know, throughout its history. So I mean, to be quite frank, short sellers have lost about ten billion dollars already on Tesla, but they continue to be short. The, the, they're convinced that their thesis is right. Basically, on, I mean, unfortunately for for some of, for some of these people who are holding these positions, they're continuously losing money. A lot of them, well, most of them. Well, but, I guess it, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so to get back on, on seeking alpha and why um, it has such a such a big short following, because um, most of the articles I'm sure you've you've seen on Tesla, they are they're short articles. You know, they're they're advocating short positions. They're saying how the company is gonna is gonna collapse, et cetera. Competition's coming, the Tesla killer, and et cetera. So that there's basically a community of. Uh, of, of people who are short the stock on Seeking Alpha much more so than the people who are long the stock, I, I, I would say. So much of the commentary you see is, is negative, especially when I write the articles. They are, you know, they're just saying how, how crazy some of this stuff is and how, how, to, how there's no way Tesla is going to be profitable, how, how it's like way overvalued and so on. So that's, that's kind of just some background information on that. Well, and, and, and to your own point, again, and, and just to be clear, I don't have a position in Tesla one way or the other. To your own point, when you do look at it, it does look, and that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to this conversation with you, someone who's spent much more time in the financials and investigating the company than I have. But when you look at it, I mean, it looks horribly overvalued and it looks like it's in a terrible shape and it's like this burning 
a plane that's on fire getting ready to crash into a mountain is what Tesla looks like in so many ways. So there's a lot of reasons why people would have a negative outlook. And there's a lot of reasons why you <laughs> your positive outlook is much more in the minority, again, which is why I'm looking forward to hearing more about it today. So, you know, th- it makes sense that there would be a negative outlook. But let's flip gears in and talk more about kind of where you're coming from. And specifically the article we, we're mentioning, you mentioned Tesla as a strong buy, which as you mentioned is um, a very contrarian view for the most part. Mm-hmm. But specifically, and everyone, model the Model 3 is like the crux of so much of the discussion for Tesla. Like it's make or break on the Model 3. Um, lots of people mm-hmm. say that. Um, but you're saying the profitability is much greater than perceived. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Mm-hmm. Sure. So, uh, yeah, f- first, uh, the Model 3, it, it is a make or break type uh, type deal for Tesla. It's their first mass market vehicle. It's the one that basically everything is riding on. So, I mean, if if this car <clears throat> basically if, if Tesla can't show that it can make, uh, a pro- you know, I guess at least some profitability making the, the Model 3, then there's basically no future for the company. That's why. Uh, this is such a crucial project for Tesla, and it's so imperative that the company demonstrates to investors that it can actually make this vehicle profitable, so it can get a uh, you know more financing for further capex to uh, to build a factory for Model Y and Tesla semi, so it can you know open its factory in China, et cetera. So basically, um, there's a lot riding on on this project, so it's it's crucial, and the reason why uh, why I believe <clears throat> it, it will be prof- profitable. And the reason why I believe it will be significantly more profitable than people assume is is for several reasons. First, um, the demand for the Model Three, I believe, it's much it's much greater than than most people perceive, than than most people believe. And and I guess so. Uh, some of the reasons for that is because I believe the Model Three, it's a it's a um, it's an incredible vehicle. It's it's basically kind of like a like how future cars should be. I mean, that's what I've heard from many people. I've interviewed uh, many people who who own the Model 3, and they say, if you, the, it comes down to this comment, I guess, if, if I could describe it in one way. If you could think of a vehicle of how it should be in the future, that's what the Model 3 is like. <laughs> so it's not, it's not like your ordinary vehicle. It's something that is, that is extremely special. So, I mean, and, and almost everyone who buys it is thrilled with it. So the, the reviews are amazing. I mean, I'm sure you know about the, the 450,000 backlog that, that's on the vehicle. And, and that's considering the fact that, you know, people who were standing in line to, to reserve the vehicle, they couldn't, you know, they basically knew that they wouldn't see it for, for you know, like two years. But they still, yeah, but they still chose to put down the reservation most of them are, st- are still waiting where they already got their vehicle. So my point here is that, you know, ma- many more people would be buying the vehicle if they could just go out and buy it instead of standing in line for a couple of years. And I'm sure that makes sense to, to a lot of listeners. The reason why it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually make more money is, is also for several reasons. First of all, the initial production process, it's, it's, it's extremely expensive and it's, um, uh, there's lots of losses involved in the initial stages. The reason for that is because it needs to be geared correctly. It needs to be calibrated right. There needs to be a, a perfect balance of automation, I guess with handwork you can call it. And obviously there were lots of uh, bottlenecks. There were lots of hiccups, lots of setbacks in the initial stages of the process. That's why uh, the gross margins for total Tesla production fell so drastically when the model three project came online basically their margins almost collapsed from like uh, from something in the range of of 24 percent automotive automotive segment margin or even 25 percent down to just like 13 or 14 percent it was at, at, at its worst level yeah it's 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 pretty drastic what kind of uh, negative impact the model three the initial model three um, stages actually. Well, well my, uh, Elon Musk said it was production hell. And I mean, you could see it in the numbers. But luckily, Tesla is starting to come out of that. The gross margin, it's steadily improving o- over the past few quarters. 
and I believe it's it's just going to keep keep going up. So that's one side of, of, of the argument. So the uh, production efficiency is going to improve eventually after after five thousand per week. Uh, the target rate is met. Economies of scale are going are going to kick in for the company. So um, costs are going to level off. Profitability is going to increase rather dramatically, I believe, at, at the company. And on the other side of this equation, it's the average selling price of the vehicle. You know, when when first when Tesla first announced this car, many people assumed it was going to have <laughs> it was going to be like a thirty five thousand dollar car. I mean, there's no way that that's going to happen over the long term. I'll I'll tell you this much. Even the BMW uh, 3 Series, which is kind of a competitor, I guess you can call it, to the Model 3, it has an average selling selling price of $45,000. Um, so the Model 3 vehicle right now has an average selling price of over 50000 And it's likely going to stay that way because instead of introducing the $35,000 version, you know, they're introducing the... Uh, uh, the, the twin, the twin engine version, version, the, uh, the performance version, which, which starts at over 70,000 plus there's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, options available. So basically average selling price is going to stay above 50,000, perhaps even be around $55,000 for the foreseeable future. And, and one more thing, the $35,000 version, even when it does come out, it's only going to, it's only going to get maybe five to 10% of of the sales because most people they don't want you know a plain a black plain no no option model three i mean this is an amazing exciting vehicle people want it to stand out people are gonna i mean people are ready to put some money down on this vehicle so there's no way a thirty five thousand dollar version would even get a large portion of the of the sales well, so and, when it's and, yeah and, yeah no i remember and i remember that piece from your article and it's an interesting dynamic yeah. because I mean, right. I, you know, I've bought cars before, as I'm sure most of our audience has. And so you hear, you know, whenever you hear, um, see an advertisement here about a car, they're always mentioned, usually they'll mention a, a price that's, it's, it's a get you in the door price. You know what I mean? And exactly. I feel like that's exactly. what $35,000 is. It gets you in Absolutely. the door. Absolutely. It's because, a beautiful marketing tool. Right. And maybe because when it, when it starts with the three, that th- there's a lot of people think, hey, that's is attainable, even if there's someone who, you know, paying more than, more than twenty thousand dollars for a car would be a big deal, but because of the brand allure and, like you mentioned, how much Model Three owners love the Tesla and just the, uh, because there's a big there's a big difference between like I know people who own Teslas and they love the company and the car, but then there's the stockholder situation that's, that often is very different. But if you focus on just the, the company and the car itself, there's like a love affair that people have, which is kind of what mm-hmm. you've described a little bit, and that's a big deal. So if someone. May are I guess the one negative of of what you've said is that there are probably a lot of people who even thirty five thousand may have been a big reach and thinking hey normally I wouldn't pay that much but I'd pay that much for a Tesla but those people may come in and, and realize oh it's I mean realistically it's going to cost at least forty maybe forty five and those people may be out and I think that that perception for a lot of people is well there's the whole selling point was it's going to reach this lower price point range of um, people. That it, that realistically, it's not going to reach anymore. So, what's the point? But I think that probably was just a misperception to begin with. Uh, absolutely, Brian, and that's and that's <clears throat> I believe that's one of the <clears throat> one of the chinks in the armor of the of the short sellers of their thesis that you know if the car is going to be like the average selling price forty five or, or fifty thousand, then it's not it's not going to get a, a lot of sales. It's not a mass market car. But to be honest with you. That's just nonsense. I mean, if it like like I said before, the BMW 3 Series has an average selling price of forty five thousand dollars. The Mercedes Benz C Class has an average selling price of of, of around forty five thousand. Same thing with the Audi A4. Same thing with their um, with their counterparts in in uh, in Japan. So these vehicles all have mass. I mean, these are all mass market vehicles. Like for instance, the uh, the BMW 3 Series sells around, you know, three hundred fifty thousand to four hundred thousand vehicles per year. That's that's a mass market vehicle. Mercedes C Class, same thing. You know, about that many. Audi A4, about three hundred thousand a year. So, I mean, these are all vehicles that are in the mass market category. So, I find it so difficult to understand why the short the short sellers claim the Model 3 is not going to be in this category. I mean, to me, clearly it will be, and it can even you know capture much more sales 
than than these vehicles that I just mentioned. I mean, if you if you compare the Model Three to the Model S, let's say, and and examine the success that the Model S has had, which last year uh, basically just about outsold its three nearest competitors. So, it, it the Model Three, so the Model S last year sold around twenty eight thousand units in the U.S. alone. So, um, its next three competitors, the Mercedes S Class, the BMW Seven Series. And the the uh, the Porsche Panamera, they sold combined about thirty thousand in the U.S. So I mean, the Model S basically, I mean, almost outsold all three combined. And if the Model Three can can capture similar, basically a similar market dynamic, it can it can easily sell three hundred thousand vehicles in the U.S. alone annually. Okay, backtrack on that a little bit. So you mentioned the the BMW three series sold. Those sell around four hundred thousand plus per year, and same with the Mercedes C Class. Yeah, that's that's worldwide. Just to uh, right, just to clarify that, not not in the U.S. Right. Okay. Okay. So, and just to again, I think maybe complete that a little bit is because I think when people hear the thirty five thousand dollar price point, you think, oh, well, maybe they're going to compete with like a Toyota Honda crowd, and it's like that's not that's not the audience. It is the, yeah, it is that's, the BMW. Yeah. It is the it is still a BMW Mercedes crowd, but it's the entry model, you know, mass market version of those companies. Again, I think from a consumer level, I think that was a misconception. Um, and basically, you're correcting that. It's like, no, it was never meant to compete with those companies. These higher price points of 45K and 50K still work really well because, again, it's competing against a, a 3 Series and a C-Class, not a Corolla and an Accord. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The Model 3, it's not a cheap car. So, I mean, there's no reason to believe that it's going to it's going to be competing with with the cheaper automobiles. It's a it's a it's a luxury premium um, entry entry or even you can be considered a midsize uh, sedan. So uh, it's only natural that it competes in the markets that it's meant to to compete in. What is and so you mentioned the Model S sold twenty nine thousand around twenty nine thousand last year. And yeah, it's all, like all their all their competitors, electric, their electric vehicle competitors, sold combined around thirty-five thousand. What um, is there an issue with the fact that you know we're talking about uh, the Model Three as an electric vehicle, but the BMW Three Series and the Mercedes C Class, those are still no not combustion. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I, 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 are, are we? Com- and, and I know they're still they're still vehicles, but they're still. I know there's a big push that or a. There's an expectation that in coming years, electric vehicles will take over much more market share, and I'm not disputing that at all. But I also don't think we're that quite there yet. Um, how much does that factor in? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand your question. It's a definitely a, a logical question, Brian. <clears throat> but I, I mean, I tend to be for forward looking, forward thinking a little bit. So um, I, I, I definitely don't view. I, I don't look. At, I don't see any any difference in I, I don't differentiate basically uh, Tesla vehicles and 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 ICE vehicles in the sense that they're competing for different markets. I don't look at it at, at all in that way. I believe that that it's just all one big market and just basically everyone is competing in it right now. So I mean I don't I don't differentiate. And um, I believe that in, in, in the upcoming years, there's, there's really not going to be a difference. I mean, electric vehicles, are, thanks to Tesla, by the way, are, are making just such quantum leaps that before Tesla, I mean, you, you've seen the electric vehicles. We're talking about the Leaf. We're talking about, you know, I guess, I guess the Prius you can kind of throw in that. They, they that really, really weren't taken very seriously. Yeah, they weren't taken and, very unless, seriously. And, unless you're driving a Prius in, in California, which is, it just always blows my mind how many Priuses are in California. But other than that, <laughs> I don't think they're taken yeah, very seriously. Yeah, I mean, they look. I mean, and the reason they weren't taken seriously is because they they looked funny. They the the range stunk. They you know they were weak. They were slow. Basically, it, it just had electric vehicle written all over it. it. I mean, there was like a stigma attached to it. And that's and, and that's what these vehicles were meant to look like. And there were and this was made by design. I mean, I mean, these were never vehicles that were um, that were supposed to be, you know, that were supposed to take significant market share from ICE vehicles for the simple fact that all the automakers have invested 
countless of billions into the infrastructure that it, that supports ICE vehicles. I mean, you have to consider, you know, huge um, engine factories that are going to be obsolete <laughs> relatively soon. I mean, these are billion, billion, you know, just tens of billions we're talking about um, spent in, you know, for these factories um, that these companies uh, have no incentive to promote um, electric vehicles. But, you know, Tesla kind of kind of came in and, and just flipped the auto industry on its head, basically. And the, the main thing that Tesla did was that it proved to, to, to everyone that electric vehicles can be better than ICE vehicles in just about every single category. I mean, look at design, Model S, Model, Model X is debatable, but Model S is an amazing looking vehicle. I think the Model 3 looks great. So uh, performance wise, I mean, if we talk about Mo Model S performance, it's, it's the, the quickest pr production vehicle out of, out of any car. So, I mean, you, you get an acceleration that's, that's faster than a, than a million dollar Ferrari or, or whatever, $2 that, million that, dollar Bugatti. That, that alone is such a remarkable thing. And for people who have, you know, been experts on EVs long before I came into the picture, that may not be a surprising factor. But I think, I don't think there's many people outside of a very, very small community of that ever would have ever would have thought that an electric vehicle would blow away almost any kind of performance car in terms of a um, acceleration standpoint. I mean, you know, like it's it it's mind blowing how powerful that yeah. mo that engine is. It's or remarkable that, that motor is. Excuse me. It's yeah, it's 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 absolutely remarkable, and you know, I'm, I'm sure many people don't don't know this now about the performance, but. I feel it's it's my uh, it's my responsibility to get that information out there, and yes, the, the Model S uh, P100D can do a zero to sixty in in two point two eight seconds. It was it was clocked in by Motor Trend, and that's faster than than the two point four million dollar Bugatti that that's you know that does it in two point three seconds. So yeah, that's uh, that's remarkable. Wait, 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 wait it, it did it said so it did zero to sixty, and you said one point. No, no, no. Two point two eight seconds. Two point two eight. Okay, that, that, okay, that's right. Yeah, the the one point is is going to be in, in in the roads. The Roadster two can can do the base model of the Roadster two that's coming out. That's you know supposed to come out in twenty twenty. They already tested it, and it can do um, a, a zero to sixty in one point nine seconds. So I mean that's that's like eons faster than than anything right. anything out there. And and it also has a top speed of two hundred fifty miles per hour plus. And it's got a range of 620 miles, so pretty pretty amazing stats. As as we can see, Tesla's technology, it you know, it's just uh, their ability to innovate is is on another level. And you know, this is why I think the competition is going to remain a couple of steps steps behind uh, on a perpetual basis. Well, and and what is such a fascinating dynamic behind this again, where you get a, the competing um, sentiment of owners versus investors and because you've got this dynamic where you, you know you're describing and again some people are going to have different views on all this but generally speaking you know tesla I mean, almost anyone who owns a tesla or has friends who do will, will testify to the what, like what you've said in terms of they are just remarkable vehicles you know they mm -hmm. outperform most internal combustion vehicles on on most every level and again there's gonna be one little thing someone can leave a comment about where it doesn't and that's fine but generally speaking the owners are extremely pleased and before tesla like you said it's almost like major car companies were trying to sabotage electric vehicles you know in terms of design and other dynamics um absolutely but, it, but, makes, but, it makes perfect sense yeah but tesla has forced their hand essentially or at least is absolutely. trying to is trying to and so on one hand, you've got a lot of big industry who would love for Tesla to fail, but you've got a lot of consumers who would love for it to succeed. And from a consumer standpoint, it seems like, hey, here's this company that appears to be making a much superior product than is currently on the market. And because of what they're doing, they're, they're causing other companies to create even higher quality products as well. So it's almost like as consumers, we should be cheering on this company as much as possible. But then you enter into the, the investing component. And when you have a financial interest in the company doing well or doing poorly, how that can completely change, I guess I'll say the human interest story behind it, if you will. And again, I'm not here to defend Elon Musk or Tesla or that kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm trying to kind of lay some of the, the, 
the cards on the table to get a feel. Because it's funny, it seems like in so many ways we should be cheering on this company and Elon Musk, but mm-hmm. it's like people, when he has a, an earnings call where he sounds like he's kind of going off the rails a little bit, it's like mm-hmm. the the, shar- the sharks hear blood in the sense blood in the waters and start going crazy, and it's like, well, what if we? What if someone tried to encourage and help the guy? You know what I mean? He seems like he's trying to do something. You know, you know, obviously he's trying to make money for himself. I get that, but there's more to it as well. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And uh, about about that earnings call, I mean, it's 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 a it's the human factor because people. You know, we all have our off days and we all get annoyed with, with certain things. I mean, people have to understand this guy is running like 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 three different, you know, futuristic companies. You know, if he if he doesn't like a question and he tells someone to uh, to back off or whatever, you know, close your mouth. I don't I don't see a problem in that. I mean, the you know, the guy can do what he wants. It's a free country and, and there's really no no problem with it, you know, from, from my standpoint. Well, and yeah, and you have the, the stand again, the dynamic as well, where you have someone, it's so easy in any situation for someone who's not in the midst of it every day, who on the outside, like, like any of us, most any of us listening are to jump in and be like, Oh, I can't believe this or that, or someone said this or whatever else. But mm-hmm. none of us know <clears throat> what that dude's living with every day. In terms of exactly. trying, I mean, this dude, <laughs> like, it feels like the world is cheering for him to fail. You know what yeah. I mean? That's what it feels like, at least on the investing side of things. Unfortunately, Un- yeah, unfortunately, yeah. right. And so cheering for him to fail, and in so many ways, if anyone out there has ever lived month to month financially, um, hopefully not many of you have, but I'm sure more, a lot of us have. You know, th- there are those points where it's like, man, when you're month to month, it is stressful. You don't know... Like you have bills that aren't getting paid or what's going to happen next. And I just imagine that's how Tesla feels. That's how Elon Musk feels. And when you're in that place and you, and again, I realize that he started a company and he wants it to be profitable to make a lot of money. But there is, I think there is a human, there is a, a goodwill factor to the company on, of some level. So he's struggling financially, trying to make things work in some ways, trying to to provide a, a product to help the world, um, at least perception wise. And and then people are cheering for you to fail, and then you're on a call and you're being questioned and challenged. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how someone would be like, "Okay, I'm I'm not playing this game anymore." <laughs> it doesn't take any imagination on my side at all. Um, but either way, I get all of the the PR side of things too. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, obviously he he got annoyed with, with some questions, but but also I wanna I wanna just just go back to the financial side of of, of yes, the uh, of the please. equation a little bit. Because, I mean, I believe there's a huge misconception on, on the part of many market participants. I mean, I honestly believe that, that many people, they don't understand the dynamics that are just the, the whole financial Tesla dynamic and what drives the stock and what, and what the company is basically all about. I mean, you have to, under, to understand Tesla, you have to understand the revenue growth story, which which is absolutely remarkable. People, you know, often mention mention Netflix. I, I, you know, Netflix is one of my favorite companies. I cover it extensively. I've owned the stock since 2011. You know, it's it's, it's been it's the best performing stock by far over the over the past 10 years. But the point is, is that people often revert to Netflix as as the most amazing, you know, revenue story there is. But however. Tesla's revenue story is much more remarkable. I mean, the, the company has grown. Uh, in, in 2013, Tesla had only two billion dollars in revenues. I mean, the the company this year will have, by you know, consensus consensus estimates, is for 20 billion. I believe the number is going to be closer to to 24 billion. That's that's my lower uh, range forecast. So, I mean, so if you in think t- about 2013 was revenue is 2 billion and 2018, yeah. you expect to be over 20. Yeah. So that's, wow. that's 10 times, you know, that's, that's, that's revenue growth. That's, you know, that's basically 10 X in a span of, of, of five years, which is, which is just, you know, it's, it's, it's mind bending. And, you know, you also have to consider that this company is in this extremely capital intensive, uh, industry, so obviously it's 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 going to have initial losses. So I mean, to me, when I look when I look at the whole financial picture, see this is this is the problem that that many many analysts and people they run into. They don't look at the whole picture. 
they only see you know that the company is is burning through through cash it lost two billion dollars last year etc cetera, etc cetera. when when in the greater scheme of things if you if you look at the enormous revenue growth and then if you if you consider the company's future profit potential really the two billion dollar loss i mean it's 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 relatively minuscule i would i would say and people and people also make this make this huge deal about you know about delayed targets in the company you know oh my god tesla didn't hit 5000 model 3 model 3 production rate you know by by the end of uh, 2017 or by the end of q1 once again these are also relatively min- minuscule developments in the greater scheme of things if you consider that the model 3 project you know it's it's likely going to be you know like a 10 year project so what's what's a 3 month or 6 month delay it's really it's really not that big of a deal you know, and and I think and I appreciate you, <clears throat> excuse me I, th- I appreciate you saying that because I think one of the things I wanted to to to, to mention was um, again I have not dug into the financials for Tesla and so a lot of my my view of the company is based upon perception so I could be completely wrong um, but there again there at least is the perception that the company is like a sinking ship. And, yeah, and so that yeah, does create that's, a dynamic. That's the perception. There is that. So that, that makes sense that people would think, oh, if they, and okay, so you have that dynamic plus the dynamic that, hey, Tesla is going to live or die by the Model 3 when it sounds like they that's keep. That's true. And, yeah, right. And so when, if it sounds like they keep delaying progress or targets on the Model 3, it says, okay, a sinking ship and your life preserver is drifting further and further away from you. It's like this dynamic of like, well, obviously this can't survive. How, like, what, and again, there's no crystal ball, but I guess the, the ultimate question is, again, how, how long can Tesla as a company remain viable um, while they, until they turn the corner on Model 3 production? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so I, think, I mean, would you agree that's, that's really a, the, a, one of the core questions that sure. investors are mm-hmm. facing? Yeah, Brian, I, I, def- I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree that um, that that the Model 3 project need, needs to demonstrate that it can be profitable. Without that, Tesla is basically doomed. But but I'm, I'm also, um, you know, 99.9% sure that Tesla will demonstrate that that the Model 3 pro- project is is an enormous success. So, um, see, uh, Tesla has um, a, a, a lot of a lot of um, ways to get capital. So even if you know, even if it was in a worse position than, than it is now, even if production of the Model Three wasn't as on point as it is now, because I believe it is on point now. The company, you know, even even in late in late May, it was already producing thirty five hundred Model Threes per week. So uh, according to to Bloomberg's uh, Model Three tracker, so I believe that the company should have no no trouble you know, uh, getting to 5k by the end of June. And even if it's at 4k, I, I, I don't see a problem with that. So long as, you know, it, on, on the other side of the equation, Tesla is already working on, on profit, on profitability, you know, it, it cut 9% of its workforce. I mean, uh, also an, an important element is the company can always cut back on R and D spending. There, there's lots of things the company can do to, to become profitable. That's not the point of Tesla. It's not the point of a company in hyper growth mode to be profitable. As a matter of fact, profits are the enemy of a company that's in hype, hyperbolic growth uh, trajectory. Because the more the more the company focuses on creating a profit, it has to sacrifice something. It has to sacrifice growth. So that's not like you know. Obviously, I mentioned the uh, the the ten the tenfold increase in. In, uh, in revenue growth o- o- over five years, I mean, the company would have never been able to to achieve this kind of revenue growth if it if it focused on on, on profit. So uh, once again, a lot of people perceive that it's necessary for the company to be profitable to be successful when when the, when you know the true paradox is that the company needs to be basically as it, it needs to be close to profitability. It needs to to uh, to basically demonstrate that it can, in theory, be profitable, but then it, it needs to not be profitable in order to uh, basically grow as fast as possible and capture as much market share 
as it can. So, so the point is really not to be profitable. <laughs> well, and I mean, of course, in my mind, yeah, I, that makes sense. Of course, the other question is, well, not being profitable is one thing, not being solvent is another. Um, how, and sure. you mentioned Tesla has a lot of ways to get capital. Yeah. Um, it's, and, and again, it's going to be solvent. See, uh, I'm sorry, Brian. No, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I just wanted to, to throw in one, one important thing in there. See, uh, a company doesn't become, become insolvent because it loses money. A company becomes insolvent when the financing gets cut off. And yeah, so. Well, and that's the fact you said, you said they have a lot of, and that's again, I've been one of those headlines of late is, you know, is Tesla going to be able to continue to get the funding, the capital they need? You mentioned they have a lot of ways to get capital. What, like, can you talk through those a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Once again, it's, it's, it's going to be helpful for the company to be, uh, you know, t- to demonstrate that it can be profitable because then it, it will be, it will be able to get financing on more favorable terms, but the company can do, can do, you know, many different things. It can, it can, it can, um, issue bonds. It can issue, issue, uh, bonds that are collateralized. It can, it can, um, it can issue stock if it wants to. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of things the company can do to, to raise capital. But I mean, one, one important factor to bring up is that Tesla had, I believe it had $3 billion at the, at the beginning. No, it it had $3.4 billion in cash coming into 2018 in the, in the last quarter, you know, it had burned through some of that. So it had like, it still had like $2.4 billion at the end of last quarter. Also, the company is continuously getting, getting deposits for, um, you know, for the model semi and then their new roadster. So, I mean, it's, it's getting capital from, from basically all over the place. And then it can, it can also, you know, get more capital in, in the ways that, that, that I mentioned, uh, that I mentioned earlier. So, I mean, honestly, the company is, is under no threat of, you know, of any kind of like imminent financial disaster, but you know, these headlines, they do sell. So, and that's why people, people write about this because either they don't understand the financial dynamic in the company or either they just want to, you know, sell, sell headlines, get clicks and these types of clicks they sell. Tell me this. You, you mentioned Netflix and, and you know, obviously you're talking about Tesla here. And both of those are companies that I remember distinctly thinking, I remember seeing Netflix at 55 bucks over years ago and thinking, that's probably a good opportunity. And I didn't do anything about it. And I remember seeing Tesla, I think it was when it was around like $25, thinking that seems like an opportunity, but I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't look into it enough. And I, I did not take action on it. Um, and now, obviously, those companies are have done very well since then. Five years from now, you know, there's all this negativity around Tesla. What what do you think things will look like from an investor perspective in five years or so, and t- like regarding this company? So uh, I think this company is uh, is the dominant leader in in EVs. I think it's going to stay ahead of the competition. You know, significantly ahead of the competition, regardless of all the EV lineups that you know we keep hearing about. They're, they're not going to take significant market share from, from Tesla, just like none of, the, none of the media giants were able to take significant market share from, from Netflix. I believe Tesla, uh, Tesla stock is the next Netflix stock in the sense that, that it's going to keep appreciating to a level that is, you know, that is, um, that's not basically, you know, it, it would sound crazy to, to some people how much Tesla is really going to be worth probably 10 to 15 years from now. I mean, I have, I have a, I have a long-term price target on the stock, a, a 10 to 15 year price target of, of $6,000. So that's, that's about a, a, a 20 times, uh, a 20 fold increase from, from current levels. I believe Tesla is going to be one of the trillion dollar companies in, in, in about 10, you know, maybe, maybe 15 years. I, I think 15 is, is, is a little, is a little long. So, you know, between 10 and 15 years, I believe is a good is a good time frame for that. In five years, I mean, once again, the the EV industry is going to be much greater. Tesla is going to be an, an obvious leader in that. It's going to be selling, you know, a few million vehicles a year by that time. Its revenues are going to be are going to be massive. I'm talking about you know well over a hundred billion dollars, possibly close to two hundred billion dollars. Um, so the company is going to be valued at maybe. 10 times what it's valued at now. So we're looking at, at about a tenfold increase in the stock price five years from now. That's, that sounds, 
that sounds extremely appropriate from my from my point of view. So that's where I think we're going to be five five years from now. Oh, and and you have to also consider Tesla's other businesses. You know, we're talking about energy generation and storage. You know, the the services side of the business, other other future businesses that are that are you know not not going you know not firing on all cylinders yet. You know, we we can discuss. Um, uh, I mean. There's huge, huge, huge potential in these businesses. We're we're talking about energy, energy uh, um, storage business. It grew at like you know it's it, it's growing triple digits year over year, and you know it can it can keep growing at that pace, and it can it can represent you know a bigger and a bigger portion of Tesla's revenues. For for instance, this year, um, Tesla's non automotive revenues are going to be like like four billion dollars. That's that's massive. So, and we, you know, oh, we, wow. we can expect that. that. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's massive. We, we can expect that. I'm sorry. Uh, I meant to say non automotive sales revenues. So, I mean, we, we can see that trend going forward. So, I mean, the, the revenue picture, it's, it's, you know, it's mind boggling. And I think, I think Tesla is going to, is going to be able to monetize, you know, that in the future in a, in a sense that it can become an, an enormously profitable Going forward, I believe five years from now, Tesla is going to be posting, you know, significant profits, possibly, you know, anywhere from five to ten billion dollars in, in, in net income. Excellent. Victor, hey, this has been a, a really enjoyable interview. Thanks so much for giving us your time. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. It was uh, it was great talking to you. Likewise. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities.